Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Heron. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to present as a part of this second season of the Equity Through Engagement series on behalf of the Office of Curriculum and Instruction. This evening, I am honored to present you with an overview of our WJCC Elementary Literacy Program and the work that we are doing to close achievement gaps for our lowest achieving students. This presentation will provide an outline of the key literacy practices that we use to provide all students with what they need in order to be successful. Our literacy program is designed to provide a solid foundation to all learners. In previous equity presentations, we have seen highlights of the specific interventions that we provide to specific groups of students. Our WJCC literacy program is designed to provide our lowest achieving students, regardless of their subject, subgroup distinction, with the best possible first time instruction. We do this so that the more specific interventions that they receive from other programs can be layered on top of a strong initial foundation. At the end of this presentation, I will present a few data points that highlight the movement our division is making towards closing achievement gaps for specific groups of students. The key literacy practices that I will now outline allow us to meet the needs of every learner. Our literacy program <coughs> is not a basal reading program, nor is it a product that comes from a package. We use a balanced approach to literacy, which means that we don't prescribe to one single method of literacy instruction. Instead, we integrate several modalities of instruction so that we can give the right amounts of support to help students become independent readers, writers, and thinkers. Inside our classrooms, teachers are providing clear and direct skill instruction using authentic texts that can be found in a library or bookstore. We integrate reading and writing instruction so that students are not only writing about what they read, but they also learn how to turn their reading skills into writing strategies. Our teachers also reinforce literacy skills in small group settings. This allows them to address the varying learning needs that are found in today's classrooms. Small group instruction is one of the hallmarks of our instructional method and is the key to closing achievement gaps. We do not deliver a one-size-fits-all instructional program. We tailor our instruction to meet the needs of our students. Our journey began in 2014 with a renewed focus on our WJC <coughs> literacy philosophy and professional development on direct skill instruction using authentic texts. Teacher teams began to meet during their common planning times to discuss the learning outcomes of their lessons. With support from their school-based literacy teams, teachers also identified teaching resources that would best support the learning outcomes. In 2015, our professional development efforts concentrated on small group instruction. We emphasized the ways that small groups can provide differentiated instruction to students. Differentiation is the cornerstone for meeting the learning needs of all students. Through differentiation in small group instruction, teachers are able to use materials with varying readability levels so that students have access to the right reading levels. They use appropriately leveled texts to practice the skills that they are learning. Teachers can also adjust and provide additional levels of instructional support to students during small groups. This creates a learning environment where all learners can move towards their goals for independent reading and writing. In 2016, we continued our concentration on small group instruction and placed a greater emphasis on using informal assessments to pinpoint exactly where teaching should begin. Using assessments to guide instruction further strengthens the supportive nature of small group instruction. And this year, we added a focus on writing instruction. The VDOE is in the process of revising the K-12 English standards, and we use this as our opportunity to stay ahead of the curve and provide a revised writing curriculum that emphasizes the integration of reading and writing. This year, we also completed a major overhaul of our elementary writing assessment plan. The change de-emphasizes the focus of writing to a prompt and instead encourages authentic writing opportunities <coughs> that can be embedded into the curriculum throughout the year. Let's take a peek into a few classrooms to see <coughs> this literacy focus in action. We find that with modeling with real text, 
it gives them the same impression of when they are in their Just Right book reading. We get a much more organic, real, authentic way that children are able to then take it and put it into their own book that they're reading. The connection with readers and writers is a huge part of what we do here because good readers are also good writers. If we're, if we're doing all of our strategies that we need to for reading, we can also apply to the same strategies as we're writing. We can't function without small group instruction here at James River. Um, our children are reading on a vast spectrum of levels. So it is super important to have small group instruction daily because you need to meet the needs of your children and where they are reading. If you don't, you will not have success in moving children forward and getting them to become readers as learners. There's no way. In 2015, we decided to make our literacy instructional philosophy more tangible and created an elementary literacy program guide. The program guide serves as a resource for teachers and explains the nuts and bolts of how to teach children using a balanced literacy approach. This program guide serves as the foundation for every decision we make about literacy instruction. One of the major changes that the Elementary Literacy Program Guide has allowed us to make is with the way that we deliver professional development to teachers. The research is clear. One of the highest effects on student achievement is the instructional capacity of our teachers. We have some of the best teachers in WJCC, and they bring a wide range of expertise with them to their classrooms every day. Because of the Literacy Program Guide, schools have been able to request specific professional development topics that suit the perspectives of their staff and students. The Literacy Program Guide ensures that all professional development is aligned under the same instructional philosophy regardless of topic. The Literacy Program Guide also allows WJCC to maintain consistency in professional development content while allowing individual schools to modify the learning formats to fit the adult learning styles and needs. Just as teaching with a one-size-fits-all mentality is no longer an accepted practice, providing professional development with that same one-size-fits-all manner is no longer the only option. The Reggie Routman Reading and Writing Connections Professional Development at Laurel Lane Elementary is just one example of how a school has used the Literacy Program Guide to choose a specific, sustained professional development focus. This video highlights the work that they are doing and is just one example of the many extraordinary professional development opportunities that are taking place in our elementary schools. This Sustained PD initiative has been fantastic. Um, this is my 11th year teaching, um, and this is the first year that I've had or been part of a sustained PD initiative. Uh, what I really like about it is that uh, I know what to expect when I'm going to these professional developments, um, and it's really nice to have the different PDs build on each other, and it helps to put together the experience of those who have been in the classroom for a while and those who are new to the profession who may have some ideas coming fresh out of school that we are not privy to. If nothing else, it creates a shared dialogue amongst colleagues um, within the school buildings and especially when there's a professional development that happens amongst the district. It just builds upon itself, which is really helpful when it comes to planning and executing these things in your classroom because I think sometimes when it's a one and done, PD, it gets practiced once and then it gets let go, but having to cycle back and revisit this over and over again, um, I think is really valuable. With the Read You Routman reading and PD that we've been doing, it's made a big difference for my students. I mean, even as early as yesterday, when I was connecting the nonfiction text features that we were learning about reading to the informational writing we were getting ready to do. You know, you kind of saw that light go off with some of them. So that's a really wonderful thing for them to be able to make those connections and understand the big picture.
At the classroom level, we monitor the progress of individual student learning through numerous division-wide reading assessments, such as the Developmental Reading Assessment, or DRA2, the Phonological Awareness and Literacy Screener, also known as the PALS Assessment, and the Measure of Academic Progress, or MAPS Assessment. Ultimately, the impact of our literacy program is judged by student performance on the English SOL tests. I have a few charts that highlight <coughs> the gains that we have made in closing the achievement gaps between specific groups of students since we began our division-wide emphasis on literacy in 2014. The next four slides are all formatted in the same manner and show gap trends for specific demographic groups of students. I will take a moment to emphasize that our WJCC literacy program does not provide support to any one demographic group. Rather, our <coughs> literacy program is designed to support the learning of all students, including our lowest achieving students, regardless of their demographic classification. The large chart at the top of the slide indicates the division-wide gap trend based on results from all English SOL tests in the given time frame. This includes the elementary, middle, and end of course English SOL tests, and provides an overall picture of the work that we are doing as an entire division. In the school year before we began our elementary emphasis on literacy, there was an overall gap of 30 percentage points for our African American subgroup. The gap was reduced to 23 percentage points, which is an 8 percent point reduction after accounting for rounding of decimal points. Underneath the overall trend chart, you'll also see the individual tables <coughs> of SOL pass rates of students in each elementary grade level. The smaller group sizes of the individual grade levels allow for wider variability from year to year. However, the data from each of the elementary grade levels is showing movement in the right direction towards closing the achievement gaps. These data on our economically disadvantaged group do not show a large reduction in the gap, but the movement is still going in the right direction. We have moved from a 26% gap in 2013 to a 23% gap in the overall division data last spring. The gap analysis of our students with disabilities group presents the area for most opportunity. We are working even more closely with our partners in the Department of Special Education to identify the areas of our literacy model that can be strengthened to increase support for our students with disabilities. This year, there has been a greater emphasis on removing barriers that might prevent our special education teachers from attending grade level planning meetings. We are also taking a closer look at how we can encourage the transfer of learning to the general education classroom from the Wilson Language Live and Passport Reading Interventions. Our largest gains in closing the literacy achievement gap for a specific group of students has been with our English language learners. I must express a cautionary reminder that when we drill down to the individual grade level data <coughs> for some of our groups, the small number of students can cause wide variability from year to year in the pass rates of that particular group. When the number of students is a gr in the group is smaller, each individual student can have a greater impact on the pass rate for the entire group. In this case, even though the grade level data changes drastically, drastically from year to year, the overall division-wide trend of reducing the achievement gap is noteworthy. In closing, this graphic is not only a great visual of how we in WJCC use a balanced literacy approach to provide our lowest achieving students with a strong foundation of high quality literacy content and instruction. The graphic also exemplifies the work we have done as a division to align our efforts and work together using a solid literacy philosophy. The positive movement that we are making towards reducing achievement gaps cannot only be attributed to one individual factor, but rather rests on the shoulders of every educator and program who has the opportunity to support student learning. Thank you for your time this evening, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Dr. Moore? Mrs. Young? Yes, can you go back to the slide that was students with disabilities? Yeah. Okay, so it's a gap increase. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the bottom line is the students with disabilities. Doesn't that show a decrease there? No, ma'am. 
Say that again. The lines are getting farther apart from left to right. So, so on the right side, it's 87 and 46. Right, I see so that. 85 and 49. So that number is closer enough to the left. So it is increasing. Okay. Basically, we still have work to do in, in all of these areas, and especially with our students with disabilities. Right, and I, I know that that's a difficult area, but Mr. Thorpe to explain this to me later. <laughs> I'm picking on him. I want him to explain it to me. <laughs> Don't be. Madam Chair, I just want to applaud um, you for your the division for their efforts and I certainly appreciate the transparency and, and while there's definitely an opportunity for growth, particularly in this subgroup, um, I think overall we're making strides. And so I look forward to, to more outside of the box thinking and creativity and, and finding ways to, to help all of our students achieve and to mitigate those. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Kelly. So, so these graphs are the same groups of students as they track through the system? So it would be from, so, so what group of students are we looking at here? So in this particular graph, we are looking at the students who were in grades <laughs> 3, 4, and 5 at the elementary level, 6, 7, and 8 at the middle school level, and the end of course at high school in 2013-14, and then the group of students that were in those particular grade levels in 2016-17. So this is not cohort data. We're not looking at the exact same group as they move through the school years. We're looking at the data from that particular grade level for that particular testing year. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, the other thing, too, the video, I was, <coughs> the one thing that struck me about the video um, is that you had a, had a teacher talking about her professional development and said that they're being exposed from the younger teachers being exposed to newer ideas. And I thought that was really very, very important uh, concept that uh, you know, just because you have more experience doesn't mean you have other, don't have something to learn from the newer teachers. And I thought that was uh, that was a real good point. So appreciated that. Dr. Beers. Yeah, Dr. Moore. I I also uh, applaud <coughs> what you and the, and the division has done. The gaps are getting smaller, um, and they get hard. You know, the smaller they get, the harder they. They, they, they get to um, remove, but um, the, uh, to me this is very impressive and um, clearly the district um, has, uh, has adopted a really balanced, sensible approach to, uh, to literacy development and, and also uh, instruction. I just, a question I have, it's probably, and it, it may be more in the area of special ed, but I'm curious, um, when, uh, how long has the Wilson program been used in, in Williamsburg with special ed kids? I don't want to miss Miss Bourgeois, I think we'll probably be able to I, take I that I always one. thought that, that, that was kind of a uh, uh, pretty, pretty standard um, instrument, uh, instructional uh, program for special ed kids. Three years ago, we did a training so that we could have uh, at least one teacher at every elementary and middle school that was trained. Um, last year was the first year that they could work with more than one student because the Wilson training is very intensive and you go to the training and then you spend year one year working with one student and being observed before you're fully certified. So last year was actually our first year with full implementation. So. Um, or, or is, or, or, are you hoping that over time um, the number of students who are worked with will increase, you know, as we get more teachers trained in that area or, or can work with, the, with two students? The Wilson program is designed for a very specific um, set of needs for students. So we do have some criteria that is used to appropriately identify students right. for that program. Uh, we have looked at possibly increasing it. We have not determined that feasibility at this time. Dr. Bears, I think it'll come down to staffing and budget and looking at the impact of the program and whether it's really having a good effect on our students. The, the, the what's really what's so critical about that, especially with with, um, with K 
kids with, uh, with disabilities, learning disabilities particularly, is that one-on-one -on -one is, it, it's absolutely, it, I mean, to me it's money in the bank. When, when, when you have a student who is having, you know, really severe problems in literacy, um, that's a uh, that's major. That's and I know, I know it costs money, but it, but it's like pay now, or we're going to end up paying later. So I I I commend that for well, all of you as well. <clears throat> Ms. Hummel? this is just thanks for all you do. Um, I just think the reading specialists, it's magic what you can accomplish uh, for our children, and. In an amazingly short amount of time, when, especially the English is uh, the ESL student, it's just really impressive to me. Um, what is authentic writing? When you when you kept I, maybe that's just a new term for me, but if you could just in layman, <coughs> absolutely. So <laughs> traditional writing might be writing to a prompt or where a teacher assigns a topic. And authentic writing would be for more, more purposes that you would see in the real world. Um, at the younger elementary levels, we try to, to really instill that love of being an author. And so we use a lot of text and, and mentor text from authors to, to build that feeling in students, and then as students get older, you might see more things like um, responding uh, about a book, a recommendation in a blog format, or something that you would see more in the real world, rather than just a, a worksheet or um, a prompt. Is it like journaling? Or? It could be journaling. That would be one part of it, absolutely. Or creating text, creating booklets, creating um, things that, that a student would feel that they could put that on a bookshelf in a library or in a bookstore. <clears throat>